Grace and peace to you. Good morning on a gorgeous February day. Welcome to worship. I have just a few announcements and reminders of things as we get started today. The first is a reminder that tomorrow is our drive through community meal. So come pick up dinner. We are having chili con carne. No, chili, just chili. Just chili mac. Okay, fine. I was going to make it fancy for you, but okay. Chili, mac, dessert, all of the good things. Come pick up and take home and eat. If you want to help, I'm sure Debbie will put you to work, so feel free to talk with her. Next Sunday is our Super Sunday. Super Sunday is the Sunday that we gather and we eat lots of soup. And then we have available for you to take home in case you don't want to cook other times during the week to have that to take home. We are going to gather downstairs. We are going to eat and fellowship. If you would like to make a free will donation for soup, uh, we are not charging directly for anything. But if you want to make a donation, all of the proceeds are going to go to benefit our micro pantry. It's being shopped heavily. We are going through a lot of groceries here at the church. So the free will offering for soup will go for that. If you want to bring in canned goods instead, you are encouraged to bring in non-perishable items for the micro pantry. We are also going to be doing that during our Lenten soup suppers, which begin on the 14th, which is Ash Wednesday. We will be gathering for worship on the 14th and for soup. Uh, the folks at Faith United are going to join us again this year. Hopefully we will not have ice and wind like we did last year. It's supposed to be much nicer. But we will gather on the 14th at 6 p.m. for dinner and for service. And then each Wednesday throughout the Lenten season, you are welcome to join us for all of them. You are welcome to come just once if that's what fits in your schedule. If you would like to make soup for Super Sunday or for any of the Wednesdays, there are sign-up sheets available in the back. Feel free to put your name down for whatever you might like to do. If you are coming to eat, you do not need to sign up in advance. Just come and enjoy the fellowship and the food. In the back, there is a purple basket. In that basket, you will see two empty M&M containers that are full of quarters. What that should signal to anybody who's been around Hickory Hills, Presbyterian Church for any length of time, is that it is a Feed My Starving Children time. Feed My Starving Children is a program where meals are packed and sent all over the world and stay here at home. We have been a part of a great big mobile pack called Feed the Need for the past several years. Feed the Need is coming up the first weekend in March, so March 1 to 3. Next Sunday, there will be a sign-up sheet available if you would like to go to one of the packing sessions. It's a lot of fun. You scoop food, you listen to music, you talk to other people, you move around a little bit, and you help other people and feel good about it. So if you want to do that, the sign-up sheet will be available starting next week. But that will be March 1 to 3. Kids, grown-ups, anybody and everybody can do so. And they have jobs for people who need to stay sitting down, even. Dave has become excellent at sticking stickers. He is a pro. But there are jobs for all abilities and ages. Are there any other questions? Are there any announcements that need to be shared this morning? Then, people of God, let us join our hearts and worship our God together. Let us worship the eternal God, 
the source of love and life who creates us. Let us worship Jesus Christ, the risen one who lives among us. Let us worship the spirit, the holy fire who renews us. To the one true God be praised in all times and places through grace of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. O God, our guide, you have led us apart from the busy world into the quiet of the house. Grant us grace to worship you in spirit and in truth. To the comfort of our souls and the upbuilding of every good purpose and holy desire, enable us to do the work you have called us to do. May we worship you not with our lips only in this hour, but in word and deed all the days of our lives. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Holy, 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 number one in the hymnal. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us then approach the throne of grace boldly, trusting in the mercy and grace of the one who created us, trusting in God's faithfulness and compassion. Let us confess our sin before God and one another. Almighty God, we, our, our, it is to be your people. You have called us to be the church, to continue the mission of Jesus to our lonely and confused world. Yet we confess we are more apathetic than active, isolated than involved, callous than compassionate, obstinate than obedient, legalistic than loving. Gracious God, have mercy upon us and forgive us. Remove the obstacles preventing us from following you more faithfully 
into a broken world that you love so much. In Christ we pray. Amen. There is no one, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We, we are, are not, not condemned, condemned for our sins, but accepted as God's own children. Believe this good news and be at peace. People of God, be at peace is the command. At peace with at peace with one another and at peace within ourselves. And so would you take a moment to share Christ's peace with one another in whatever way you are most comfortable this morning. The peace of Christ be with you all. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 40, beginning with verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are the grasshoppers, who stretches out of the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and high, on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in, he is great in strength, mighty in power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord.
People of God, our gospel this morning comes from Mark chapter 1. We are picking up where we left off last week. And that's going to be important as we think about the fact that this is a Sabbath day. Jesus has been to the synagogue. He has taught and set someone free from a demon. And then we pick up at verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening, at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick, or possessed with demons, and the whole city gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. 
And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for this is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If I were to ask you to describe for me your pattern or your habit of life, what would you say? Are you someone with an intentional way of doing things? Or do you find that it is perhaps haphazard at best? Do you have the best of intentions on Sunday night or Monday morning for the week that you're going to work from a schedule, that you have a pattern and a rhythm established? wake up in the morning and just hope to make it to bed the next to bed at the end of the day or maybe make it to the end of the week how are you at pacing yourself are you someone who has it carefully outlined these are the things that have to be done these are the things that could be done these are the things that it's okay if they don't get done are you someone who is easily distracted? You start a project, and then you find another project, and then you find another project, and by the end of the day, you have started six projects and finished none? How are you at listening to your mind or your body that says, hey, we've done enough, I'm tired? Or perhaps you are like me, you get to the end of the day, sit down and go, Oh my, I'm more tired than I thought I was. How are you at a rhythm of life? We are a people who live with clocks and schedules. Many of you are scientists. Some of them can even send you texts and alerts and notifications and all of the other things that you probably don't need right this moment. All of us carry phones that can schedule us, not just down to the second, but to the nanosecond, can't they? We live our lives using the technology that we have in a way that is scheduled. We can literally go from one hour to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, and have meetings or duties or responsibilities or things to do every second of every day. But we weren't created for that. Do you know that? We were not created for the constant movement, the constant scheduling, the one thing after another, after another, after another. We were created by God for a rhythm. And we know that because if we pause and look around our world, we see rhythms, natural rhythms all over the place. We are in the middle of winter. I know it doesn't look like that outside right now. But we are in the middle of a dormant time in our area of the world where everything is underground where all of the activity and the growth is waiting to happen until what? Spring, a time of planting and germination, and then summer, a time of growing, and fall. And then we move back into a time of dormancy over and over again. The sun rises and there is daylight. The sun sets and there is night. Each day 
begins and ends, and without electric lights, without all of the constant buzzing and humming and electrical ability around us, we would stop at night too, wouldn't we? Because it's harder to get things done in the dark. We are told that God created the world in six days. And that it was on the seventh day that God rested. Why? Because God needed a break? Or because God was trying to teach us human beings something new? God created the Sabbath day, called it good, and offered it as a gift to humanity. We are intended to live our lives in a rhythm of doing and not doing, of rest and work. So how is it that we have become so frantic and so distracted and so full of so much to do? In our gospel this morning, we read about Jesus in a very busy, frantic kind of day that was intended to be the Sabbath. It began the last day of the week, which is Sabbath day. Jesus goes to the synagogue for worship, and in standing up to read scripture and to talk about what he has just read, he is confronted by a demon. We picked up the story after that, as soon as they had left. They go to Simon's house, and they are confronted by someone else who is sick and in need. Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law as well. These two healings, the demon and the fever, happen outside the rules of Sabbath. No work, including healing, according to those who interpret the law, according to the strictest interpretation, healing is working. And so what should have been done is that Jesus should have waited until sundown, the end of the Sabbath day, to do any of the work that, it do that he does. So does that mean that Jesus has thrown out the Sabbath and we should be working seven days a week? No. In this particular story, Jesus is modeling for us the reality that over and over again he will challenge the rules, but always for the sake of good and justice. Jesus will challenge the letter of the law in order to help us see the spirit of that same law. Jesus will be condemned over and over again by those who enforce the rules for breaking them. And yet, and yet, Jesus seems to be showing some, us something different. But in compliance with the law, the story continues. At the end of the day, at sundown, what happens? But everybody comes to Simon's house. The town, we are told. Everyone gathers. They bring everyone with aches and pains and possession and illness. All of them come to be healed. All of them come and gather inside the house, outside the house. You can imagine the crowd gathered around this little home in Capernaum. And Jesus heals them. He models for us a life of humble service. He cares for others. He sees these people in their need with compassion. It's important to also note that Simon's mother-in-law immediately got up and started serving them, not because somebody told her to, not because that was her job, but out of gratitude. Out of the joy for the healing that she has received, she gets up and begins to serve. And we see this pattern over and over again. Those who Jesus healed immediately began to proclaim the good news of what God had done for them. As darkness falls, as the crowd heads back home, Jesus and his companions also go to sleep. In the morning, in the 
morning, Jesus withdraws to a quiet place. In the morning, Jesus disappears in order to be away from everyone else, in order to be in the presence of his Father. He is choosing, choosing space. Jesus understood that his life required a pattern of work and rest and prayer. And we will see Jesus live this pattern throughout his life. He constantly is trying to withdraw from the crowd. Why? Because he doesn't want to be there? No. Because Jesus understands that he can only do so much, and then he needs a break. You know, like the rest of us. When the disciples hunt him down and find him, they come with a to-do list and an agenda. Everyone is looking for you. Everyone is searching for you, Jesus. You need to come back to the house so that you can do the thing that you did yesterday at the end of the day. There is more work to be done. And what is Jesus' response? No. No. Because Jesus understands his mission in a way that the disciples do not. Jesus said, I have come out in order to go to the other communities. Now, there's a lot that we can unpack with that, but today I want to stay with Jesus in this one day. What can we learn from a day in the life about Jesus? What his ministry and his mission were intended to be? What do we see about how Jesus understands himself and what it is for us as his followers? You see, the disciples see Jesus' ministry as obviously one of healing. It's the first thing he does, right? So, of course, what they want to do is set up shop. They've got a faith healer right here. We'll hang up a shingle, and people will come to us. Except that that's not how Jesus understands his mission. He didn't come for this purpose. He came to proclaim the good news that God is with us, that God's kingdom is already here in and among us and ahead of us and around us. And Jesus knows that in order to do what God wants him to do, he has to go from town to town to town to meet people where they are, not to expect them to come to him. Jesus goes to. He also models a new way of doing Sabbath. He observes the Sabbath. We know because we are told that Jesus goes to the synagogue. That means he goes to church in the ancient world. It means that Jesus gathered with the believers in a physical place to worship God in a regular rhythm. He thought it was important to gather with others. But he also chooses to break the Sabbath rules when it is a matter of justice, when it is a matter of mercy, when it is a matter of giving God's life-giving power to someone else. And so Jesus will break the Sabbath in order to give Sabbath to someone who has been bound. Jesus will break the Sabbath in order to give new life to someone who has been deeply suffering. Not breaking the Sabbath for the sake of breaking the rules, but in order to offer that grace of God to others. Sabbath and worship, then, can be an act of liberation. Sabbath and worship can be an act of liberation, like a man set free from a demon, like a woman set free from a fever. Jesus isn't saying that Sabbath doesn't matter. Contrary to our whole society's pattern of the world, Sabbath matters. Rather, Jesus is inviting us to understand it as freedom, to understand that God's 
freedom is for all people to receive. This also shows us a pattern. This day that we see in full, Jesus shows us a pattern. He works hard. He rests and withdraws to pray. And we'll see it over and over again. Jesus is inviting us to learn from his pattern. At the end of the day, when the crowd goes home, Jesus rests. He doesn't do 12 more things on the to-do list. When it is dark and quiet, he goes to bed. Early in the morning, before anybody else can chap him on the shoulder and say, hey, I need something, Jesus withdraws, he slips away, and finds a place to pray. This is also a form of rest. This is unplugging from the needs and expectations of other people. Jesus knows that he is going to be bombarded with need from day beginning to day's end over and over again because people are coming to seek the good news that he offers. And so he withdraws and unplugs from people's needs in order to restore his own soul. In order to commune with his father, Jesus told us he would do nothing that the Father didn't tell him to do. And that includes the need then to reconnect with God day by day by day. And so Jesus quiets the distractions. He goes up on hills. He goes to quiet places. He sneaks away in order to be. In order to be with God. Jesus also models for us the setting of boundaries. We're not always good at that, are we? We're not always good at setting boundaries, but Jesus is. And we see that with Jesus because the disciples come and say, everybody's looking for you. Everyone wants to see you. Everyone needs you. And rather than saying, yep, I'm on my way, the way many of us would do, yep, over here, Rather than that, Jesus says, no, no. It's a great little word that many, many of us ought to learn, isn't it? No, not because he doesn't care, not because he's done with Capernaum forever, not because these people don't matter, but because this is not the purpose for which Jesus has been sent. And so Jesus says, no, because he understands what his rules and parameters and purpose and mission and vision is. And so he says no to this thing in order to do a bigger thing. Jesus has come to proclaim the good news, and he sets out clear boundaries around the mission so that he is not distracted from his purpose that God has called him to. And so these are pieces that Jesus gives us over and over again, a rhythm and a pattern and a way of life, a being in the world that isn't frantic. Even when he is interrupted, Jesus doesn't seem bothered, does he? Why? Because Jesus crafts and creates space in his daily rhythm. He is purposeful and intentional even when he is interrupted and distracted, and even when other people don't understand what he's up to. He holds to his purpose and his mission. He understands his own limits. Because Jesus, having taken on humanity, having become one of us, takes on our limits. He gets tired at the end of the day. He's worn out by constant demands. He needs sleep. He needs rest. He needs time with his Father. Jesus needs these things because he has become one of us. And we need these things as well. We need connection with each other. We need connection with God. We need regular rhythms of rest. We need time that we have unplugged. 
We need life in rhythm. We need to relearn, people of God. We need to recover and to give ourselves and our families and our neighbors and our friends and the people we encounter permission to rest, to refresh and revive, to unplug, to engage in a new way. We need to invite people because we need to begin to do it for ourselves as well. And so I want to invite you, if you are someone who is in desperate need of a rhythm, don't change it all because it won't work. It just won't. You cannot sit down today and say, this week I'm going to do all of these things. By Monday at 9 a.m., you won't have done it. It's too big. It's too much. So find one thing. What one thing do you need to just stop? What one thing do you need to just start doing? Do you need to set a regular bedtime and actually make sure you do it? Do you need to turn off the phone or set it aside? Do you need five minutes of quiet to start your day or at lunch or to end your day? Choose one thing and practice it this week. Just one thing. And then make sure that you tell someone, and I don't care who it is, come tell me, email a friend, tell one another, but tell someone what you're doing so that they can ask you how it went because accountability matters, but also so that if it goes well, you can celebrate with them because when we are celebrated and when we celebrate things, we are more likely to continue them. This is how it works to establish rhythms. Choose one thing to stop, to take on. One way that you could engage a healthier rhythm for your life. Just one thing. But practice it every day this week. Because... As it says in Isaiah, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. God does not grow faint or weary. God does not grow faint or weary. And God gives power to the faint, strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary. Even the young seem to have inexhaustible energy, will fall exhausted. But those who wait, those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. What rhythm do you need to renew your strength? Amen. This is the body, this is the blood, broken and poured out for all of us. And in this communion, we share in his love. This is the body, and this is the blood. Well, I will remember everything, Lord, that you've done for me. I won't take for granted the sacrifice that set me free. and poured 
of God, as we prepare for communion, are there joys or concerns that you have to share with one another this morning? Gordon. You're very welcome. Other things. Gabby, welcome back. Mm-hmm. Okay. So your nephew and his wife are first names. Just first names. Give me first names. Rodney? Okay, I don't need last names. Huh? But Jeff. Okay, and then your ex sister in law's name is Sharon. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll hold them in prayer. Absolutely. Other things. Please be in prayer for Katie and for Joe as they are just having a hard time. It's just a struggle. Um, Joe's health is going to continue to decline. Um, and Katie is doing more than she should and is in need of our prayers. Um, other things? Yes, do I have another one? Thank you for the sunshine and the hope of spring. Yes, because that just feels really good, doesn't it? All right, people of God, we are going to gather at the table.
Let us pray. Holy God, we give you our thanks and our praise. For you have made us. You made the world we inhabit. And before the world, you made our eternal home in which through Christ we have a place. All that is spectacular, all that is plain, have their origin in you. All that is lovely and all who are loving point to you. And as grateful as we are for the world we know and for the universe beyond our knowing, we particularly praise you, whom eternity cannot contain, for coming to earth and entering time in Jesus. We give you thanks for his life, for the pattern that he gave us that informs our living, for his compassion which changes our hearts, for his clear speaking which contradicts our generalities, for his disruptive and disturbing presence, for his innocent suffering, his fearless dying, his rising to life, and breathing forgiveness. We praise you, O oh God, and we worship him. We lift before you and your Holy Spirit both the concerns and the joys of our hearts. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick and struggling. We pray for Katie and for Joe. We pray for Jeff and his family. We pray for Sharon and her family. We ask, Lord, that you would comfort those who grieve. God, in a world that is torn apart, we pray for your peace. Though we do not see it, we ask for it. Though we do not understand, we ask for your wholeness. Though we cannot hope to meet the needs that are surrounding us, Lord, we ask that you would help us, that we might do what we are able, with courage and compassion. Merciful God, send now your Holy Spirit to make our sharing this bread and cup a sharing in Christ's body and blood. Let that same spirit rest upon us, converting us from the patterns of this passing world until we conform to the shape of Christ, whose food we share and in whose name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread but forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. People of God, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are welcome at this table regardless of what church you may have been baptized into or where you may have come from. You belong in this space, in this moment, because this is not our table. This is the table that belongs to Christ. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. After giving thanks, he broke it and blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after they had eaten, he took the cup and poured it out and said, this cup is the new covenant. It is the good news of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, and remember me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Invited forward, come and take a piece of bread. 
come and take a cup. You can dispose of your cup over here. And if you need a glue, ready.
People of God, let us pray together. God of grace, you renew us at your table with the bread of life. May this food strengthen us in love and help us to serve you in each other. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We are going to sing together number 517, Here, O oh Our God, We See You. If you are able, would you stand and stretch your legs? People of God, you are nourished and you are sent. You are gathered and you are sent out. So go. Go and find a small piece of rhythm, a small piece where God will meet you day by day. For it is in nourishing us and sending us out that God proclaims that the kingdom has come near, that God is with us. So go in peace. Amen. <laughs>